Yeah, I'm back. Um, <laughs> it's exactly how we had it planned. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my closing book backstage. So hopefully that appears or we'll just be here all day. So um, good morning. Our biggest problem isn't that we tell lies. It's that we live them. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, that's kind of where we're at in this series is realizing that it's not just a problem that we tell lies. It is a problem, but we live these lies. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, as you can see him here, um, at the highlight of his career, meeting Megatron in the Transformers 3 movie. Some of you might know him also as the second person to walk on the moon um, behind Neil Armstrong, but um, the original Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Aldrin um, was berated back in 2012 by a conspiracy theorist um, at a hotel in Beverly Hills. Maybe you saw all this story. Um, a Tennessee man who is one of the, say, 5 to 6% of people um, in America that believe that the 1969 moon landing was fake. This man had made a few low-budget films, which I think is funny that he made low-budget films to prove that the moon landing was a low-budget film. Um, but anyway, to prove his point, um, he was no doubt trying to add to his footage and making a documentary or something like that when he trapped Aldrin into thinking that he was doing an interview for a children's show. And so Buzz showed up ready to talk about walking on the face of the moon, one of the few people in the world who have ever done that. And he, instead, he's blindsided outside this hotel by a man calling him a liar and a thief. But before he could get the word thief out of his mouth, Buzz punched him in the face. <laughs> and it was a pretty good punch. There's a video and you can watch it as many times as you want on loop. It's amazing. The 72 year old man squared him up pretty good. He still got it. Um, but but I, I started thinking about that after I, I had heard this story a few years back and I was like, I can't believe that happened. One of the most famous people in American history just socked a guy. And I mean, he's still like, I mean, he's fine. There's no like charges or anything like that. The guy was like, yeah, probably deserve that. But uh, I was thinking like, what if that was the, what if that was the case um, in real life? Like if, if any, anytime we told a lie about someone that uh, we got punched in the face by that person, <laughs> like, if that was just, I mean, it's kind of how it works at my house anyway with my kids, but like, what if like the immediate response to you lying about someone, what if there was like an AI robot that just sat by your computer and was like, bam, don't post that. Like, like you can't share that, okay? And it is true that telling lies can obviously get you punched in the face, but there is a worse fate. Um, the enemy has set a path of lies that doesn't stop at just telling lies. We actually start to live these lies out and with dire consequences. Here's how John Mark Comer says in his book, we've said this the last couple weeks, is that um, living lies is when deceptive ideas play into disordered desires, which are normalized in a sinful society. These deceptive ideas come in many shapes and sizes and forms. It's an easy way out or it's an advantage that in your career path, it, it meets your immediate needs. It stops the fight with your spouse or whatever. Um, it, it screws over the person that you already dislike anyway. It, it gives you what you think you deserve. It's been justified so much that you think it's the best way to even keep going. You'll just tell yourself that the lie is, is exactly what needs to happen. I can't tell the truth now because that would cause so much hurt and problems and pain. And so we, we've moved from telling lies to actually living them. Lies tell us what we want to hear. They give us what we think we need, and then they encourage us to wrap ourselves in a society or in a culture that only affirms those lies. And so we isolate ourselves from people trying to tell us the truth, or what's worse, we, we find a group of people that will just affirm those lies more and more and more. We call those echo chambers, deceptive ideas, disordered desires, sinful society. Now, last week in Wayne's message, he gave us some defensive tools to take every thought captive. He shared some ways that we can avoid buying into the lies altogether. Some of the ways that he said these are kind of like defensive ways, like, you know, rejecting or filtering or surrendering all of your thoughts to Christ. Do everything that you can to protect your mind and your soul from the attacks of the enemy. Play good defense, like good Baltimore Raven defense. <laughs> I know, I, we've already had one service. I got berated in the, in the, you know, outside in the lobby. I was like, it's not personal. I'm a Broncos fan, so it's just 
painful, okay? So the joke's on me, but good defense, right? To play good defense. He, he mentioned having a helmet that, that protects your mind, setting up a filter, setting up boundaries, limiting your devices, being mindful of what shows you're watching or the things that are forming you turning off the, the talk shows, minimizing the noise. All of these are great defensive strategies to take every thought captive. As a matter of fact, that was the verse that we were, we were memorizing this, this week, to take every thought captive. And this morning, I want to look at the other side. Even if we set up all of these defensive, prohibitive measures, you can still be susceptible to lies. I remember one preacher here, and one preacher specifically talk about pornography addiction, how he says that, that we have more of a software problem than we do a hardware problem. And he wasn't talking about computers. He was saying we have more of a software. So, so you can throw out the computer. You can put on the, you know, the filtering devices. You can throw out your phone or your tablet. You can have all these external guardrails that can be very helpful. But the heart will find what the heart desires. How many of you try, have tried to hide the snacks in the back of the pantry, knowing that you won't be able to find them at three in the morning when you're hungry, right? The heart desires what the heart desires. And so, so we have more of a software problem with our hearts than we do a hardware problem. All of these defensive things are great. We've got to fix the heart. Scripture tells us that the heart is deceitful. David says, David says that the, the heart and the flesh will fail us, but God never will. All these defenses in the world can't hold up to the, what the heart wants when it wants to be deceived. You could say it this way, that the heart is, that is not set on truth will live on lies. A heart that is, that is hungry for lies will find what it needs to eat. But there's good news. Psalm chapter 33 tells us that God cripples and frustrates the plans of evil with his words. So if lies are Satan's primary weapon that he uses against his, uh, God's people, if lies are the primary weapon that, that, that we've seen, our greatest counter weapon to those lies has to be the truth of God's word. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Matthew chapter four. And while you get there, I'm gonna grab that book from you. So cameras, you don't have to follow me. I know that's annoying. I'll be back, I promise. There we go. Thank you, Wayne. My armor bearer there. Um, okay. Uh, Matthew chapter four. Let's do a little bit of, of, of background um, in the life of Jesus. I know it's only been a few weeks since Christmas, but like when we get to chapter four of Matthew, Jesus is already 30 years old, okay? He's already fully grown. Now, um, we're, he hasn't called any disciples yet. He hasn't started his ministry. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of those are focused on the ministry of Jesus, the three years of ministry that he did. And he hasn't done any of that yet. As a matter of fact, in chapter three, Jesus was just baptized. The end of chapter three, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. And I point this out. This is important to remember because what we're about to go into, the temptation of Jesus, is, uh, it, it comes right after, 40 days after he was baptized. It's the next thing in the text. And I point this out because we often, I think, have a view of discipleship that ends at the baptistry. Like we think that like we walk someone along the path of discipleship and once we baptize them, then they are a disciple and we don't really, we don't really have, a, there's nothing, nothing left. Like they leave, you know, the baptistry, they've been saved so they can ride that holy wave all the way to heaven. And I, I just say this as, as something that we just, we just need to pay attention to. It's a warranted to celebrate a baptism. It's one of the greatest things that can happen in a church service on Sunday morning. And when we come together in our times on Sundays, we must celebrate when a, when a life crosses over from death to life, when someone surrenders everything that they have to the cross of Christ. But we can't for a second think that a new believer who has come up out of the water is done. Jesus comes up out of the water and he's led to the wilderness. I was, I was part of a baptism once where uh, a guy was baptized and as they were walking him out kind of up the stairs, he came up the rail, he slipped. This didn't happen here, so no fear, but he slipped and broke his ankle, like right out of the baptistry. And we were kind of like, maybe put him back in? I don't know, like, like maybe try again because he's not off to a good start. Like this has not gone well. But, but we tend to think that like you come up out of the water, boom, glory, hallelujah. But it's after this decision that they become a problem for the enemy. Satan isn't really concerned with someone living on his side, someone living his lies and living out all the lies that the world is living. But it's, it's when they've decided to walk away from those lies and to live in the truth of God's word, that's when they become a problem. 
to us after they've made that decision. And so we should celebrate, but we should immediately surround those who are baptized in prayer and confidence and mentors in the faith because that is when they are the most susceptible to remember their old life, their previous sins, the stuff that, that, that they talk about in CR, the stuff that will just grab the habits and hangups and hookups and sins, all of those things that will, that will lead them back towards a life of lies. And so here we are in Matthew chapter four. Jesus is gonna, is gonna give us the way to fight the devil. Here he goes. It, it, Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. Now, many of you've read this story. You've, you've heard this before. It's early on in Matthew. So if you start a New Testament reading, you probably made it here before you quit. Um, but like, we know this story. Jesus is tempted by the devil. But I've read this story my whole life, and I don't know if I ever made this connection, that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Yeah, you're like, well, it says it right there, dummy. Like, just read your Bible. Well, it is the Spirit, not a spirit, not an evil spirit, not a deviating spirit, but the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness. I've often thought that, that Jesus was into the wilderness, like he went into the wilderness and he was praying and he was fasting and then, and then, and then Satan shows up. That's how I, I, I would remember the story. Like, well, Jesus was out in the wilderness, he's praying and fasting, connecting to the Father, and then he shows up. What the text says here is that he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. That's why he's there. And in preparation for that temptation, he takes 40 days and 40 nights to fast and to pray. I think this is important because we kind of switched that up. I know I did in my brain where it was like, well, Jesus just found himself in the wilderness and boom, the devil was there. He was led there. Jesus is showing us the best way to fight against Satan and his schemes. You could say that the first rule is, is don't be surprised when you find yourself in the wilderness. Don't be like, where did all these lies come from? Oh, I, you know, I didn't know people lied. Like, don't be surprised. Jesus is not surprised by the temptation. In a couple of chapters, he's gonna teach his disciples how to pray. And they're gonna say, teach us how to pray. And, and one of the things he says, this is what you wanna pray every time. Do you remember what he says? Lead us not into temptation. And maybe you've looked at me like, why would God lead you into temptation? Well, he did for Jesus. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus is saying that, that, that when, if and when you find yourself in the wilderness, pray that you don't end up in the wilderness alone with the devil. But when you do, I'm gonna show you how to cling to the truth. When you do, I've shown you how to walk this path. It's not an insurmountable thing. If you find yourself there, it's not a defeatist attitude. There's no way out. I'm gonna give you the tools to do so. So Jesus fought the enemy, not with physical strength or mental strength, but spiritual truth. He doesn't really outwit the devil. It's very short scriptures that he uses. It's very, very, uh, very pointed things that he uses here. So each attack we're gonna see Satan hurl at Jesus is the same way that he tries to attack us. It's kind of like Satan is walking around like an electric fence. You know, maybe you grew up in church where people would, would pray over you a hedge of protection. You guys remember that? Is anybody ever I'm a hedge of protection over you to be protected from the devil's schemes? Well, you know, we're in the 21st century now, so a hedge can be a, an electric fence of protection, right? Let's build electric fences of protection around us so the devil can't get in. But if you've ever been around electric fences, sometimes they don't always work all the way around. You ever seen like a cow or a dog try to get through an electric fence? Like they'll test it, right? They'll like go to one spot and hit that. Like, oh, power's still on there. It would go around and do that. Say, okay, maybe children do this too. But like, like, where can I get into this? You know, like I'm gonna test it here, test it here. Test it. This is what Satan is doing. He's, he doesn't just come on and just like, you know, full on. He's like testing. Where can I find a spot? He's poking and prodding until he finds a spot that you're susceptible and he can climb through and start to, to sow his seeds of doubt and his lies and deceit. And so in this fence, there's, there's, there's four specific ways that he's gonna come after you. He doesn't really change his plans. He doesn't really have to. They're working just fine. But here's, here's where he's coming after you. He's gonna, he's gonna test your identity, your desires, your priorities, and your ego. And if you look at verse three, we see he goes right in on Jesus. It says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, sometimes we skip over the first part of that verse. If you are the son of God, did you notice the jab at Jesus' identity? Most people skip it because, you know, it's just like we're getting to the, the bread and the stones and that sort of thing. 
This mocks the very identity of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. If you jump back one chapter in the book of Matthew, Jesus is baptized, and as he comes out of the water, what happens? A voice from heaven comes, comes from the sky, and the Father says, this is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. It confirms his identity as the Son of God, as part of the Godhead, the, the, the one true Son of God, the only begotten, the one that the whole Bible is about. And then just a chapter later, just 40 days later, a voice comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, if he sows the seeds of doubt. Now, now here we have the accuser twisting and questioning, sowing seeds of doubt. The, the same tactic he uses in Genesis 3 with Eve when he says, did God, did God really say? Did you actually hear it? Was it an audible voice? Are you sure that, that what he said about you is true? In the garden, Eve listened and doubted along with the enemy. You'll notice that Jesus is going to ignore this accusation twice. He's just not even going to acknowledge it. By the third time Satan tempts him, he doesn't even use that. He doesn't say, if you are the son of God. The first two times, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do this. The third time, Satan just jumps right into the accusation because he's like, all right, that's not working. And that's how it needs to be. When, when Satan attacks your identity, let's make it a non-starter. When, when he asks you, are you really a child of God? You know the song we sing, uh, um, you know, that we're chosen, not forsaken, that, that he's, he's for us and not against us, all of those things. When that is questioned, do you have an answer to immediately shut him up? Or are you, are you filled with the same doubt that he's trying to get you to believe? Are you trying to go, oh, well, you know, he said I was not forsaken, but I feel pretty alone right now. He said I was chosen, but I don't feel very special right now. And so you start to play along with the devil's schemes. Do you have a firm grip on the truth of what God says about your identity? You know, I had a, a piece of my identity stolen from me this week. Um, it's actually a little hard to talk about. I might even tear up, but I went to, uh, I went to our new Chick-fil-A here on the north side. Praise God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> You Southsiders don't know the persecution that we have faced. <laughs> and so here we are. We have a Chick-fil-A. And I am proud to say that day one, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose, but maybe the purpose of the Lord. I was there. Um, and a couple days later, I decided that I wanted to try something different, Okay. I wanted to try something new. I've been eating Chick-fil-A for a long time. I always get the same thing. I usually get two chicken sandwiches. I don't mess with the fries. Don't need, don't need to take up that space. I know that's blasphemy to some of you guys, but I want the chicken. So I decided um, I was going to try this. I was going to try to just get one spicy chicken breast, okay? Not because I'm healthy, uh, without the bun, all that sort of stuff. Not because I'm healthy, but I got plans, all right? So got one spicy chicken breast, and I was going to get a large side of mac and cheese, and I was going to make myself some buffalo mac and cheese, okay? But I had to go. I couldn't order it through the app, which is how I would normally do it because people. But um, I, I had to go up there because I needed a bigger bowl. Like, it doesn't come in a big enough bowl to do all this with. So I'm going to, like, make this all together. And, and I asked them. I go through. I was like, all right, I just need, I need a spicy chicken breast, no bun, no pickles. And then I need a large... Um, Mac and cheese. That's all. That's all I need. And then, oh, and I, was, I need a. I need an extra bowl. Like, could you get me a bigger bowl? And they were like, Oh, are you doing that TikTok thing? I immediately apologized and left the building. No, I. I had become one of them. I had become one of them. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I did say, I'm so sorry. You've probably had a hundred people ask you this today, but I just wanted to try some buffalo mac and cheese. All I wanted to do was make this. And they were, they were like, oh no, it's no problem at all. And they give me a salad bowl, which is hilarious. A huge salad bowl that I'm mixing up cheese and chicken and buffalo sauce. And by the way, absolutely delicious. So maybe TikTok is a little bit redeemable. Absolutely delicious. But, but, but this, is, this is the truth about it. Like we've, we will fall into lies and deceit of the enemy. We're just looking for people to identify with, you know? I'm not going to lie. After that, I was like, maybe TikTok has some other recipes I could go. And I don't have TikTok, but I'm like, I'm kind of going on there and be like, okay, maybe, I could, maybe there's other things that I'm missing out on. And we find people to identify with. People, people join cults, gangs, and yes, even political parties because their identity is, is found in something in that group. There's something about that group that just like, oh, pulls me in. When it comes to your identity, make it a non-starter. 
with your battle with the father of lies. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge it. He just like lies. He doesn't even acknowledge it. Resist the urge to find your identity in something else because Satan is going to take advantage of that. Look back to verse three. It says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, it is written, for man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now Satan is gonna go after Jesus' earthly desires, his humanity. Each time Jesus answers Satan, he quotes scripture. And this is why we're encouraging everyone to, to, to memorize scripture during this series. Each, each week, it's not a long, big swath of scripture. It's just, just a verse that we want you to memorize. And, and, and each time, this is actually the one we're gonna memorize this week, but each time, this one comes from Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament, okay? Which is, which is fine. You can quote the Old Testament, but we usually wanna quote like the clobber verses from the Old Testament, Right? Jesus says, Jesus says to him, man does not, must not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. This, is, this harkens back to a time in Israel's history when they were, they were wandering in the wilderness. Sound familiar? And, and, and they're grumbling and griping and they're hungry. Some of you are seeing the veggie tails in your head, right? It was like, it's okay. They're, they're hungry and they're vegetables, so nobody's gonna eat them, but... But here they are, they're grumbling, and God's like, God's like, okay, I'm gonna provide for you. And he gives them manna, manna which gives them sustenance, but doesn't really taste all that good, and it's kind of bland, and it's just kind of, you know, like every day it's the same kind of thing. And so eventually they get tired of that, and they're grumbling again. And so in Deuteronomy, Moses is reminding the people, retelling the lesson here, that the lesson that Israel learned was that physical hunger pains pale in comparison to spiritual starvation. You can be walking around as, as full as possible on everything that life gives us, but you can be spiritually malnourished and spiritually starving. And I don't know about you, but I'm a different person when I'm hungry. Anybody else? Any other hangry people in here? Okay. I'm a different person when I'm hungry. And we're different people when we're hungry for our desires, for food, for sex, for caffeine, for attention, Whatever it is, fill in the blank for you. But we, we change into different beasts that dismiss all of the behavior around us. You'll be like, I'm only acting like that because I haven't had dot, dot, dot. And so after Jesus fasts for 40 days, Satan is leaning into his humanity. He knows that he's hungry to see if he would crumble and grumble just like the Israelites did. There's a truth to remember that the enemy attacks when the flesh is needy. The enemy attacks when the flesh is needy. He's not gonna attack you with your Bible in hand. Yeah, he's gonna try to distract you. He's not gonna, uh, if you're out, you're out hanging out with Wayne, you know, on a lunch date, that's not, that's not what he, when he's coming after you, right? You've got a, a guard beside you, right? He's not, gonna, he's not gonna go when you've got your, you know, your helmet of truth and your, you know, all of that, shield of truth and helmet of salvation, when you're memorizing verses or singing praises. That's why we're encouraging all of this because you keep, yourself, um, you keep yourself in the truth of God. Satan is defeated, but he's not an idiot. He's not coming up to a completely fortified, you know, maximum security fence here. He's gonna wait for you to be lonely and alone. He's gonna wait for you to be weak and needy. He's gonna wait for you to be bald, not bald. Some of you heard that and took offense, but it's fine. Bald, bored, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Maybe you've heard these before. Bored, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. These are the things that we look around and it's when our flesh starts to get weak. These are the things they'll warn every recovering addict about when your defenses are down, when your filters are thin and you might just say what you're thinking, not what you're feeling, or you might say what you're feeling there's no filter there. When you can easily convince yourself that you deserve pleasure or a fix or a win, you've heard the saying, idle hands are the devil's playground. When we're bored, when we're hungry, when we're angry, lonely, tired, that's when he attacks. So how did Jesus fight back? How did Jesus win the battle? Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. And I believe that that's some of the reason he was led into the wilderness to be tempted so that we could take example of that. We could understand that it's possible to defeat him. How did he fight back? Well, we know that Jesus was praying and he was fasting. Now, fasting is, is one of those practices that we like to pretend doesn't apply to us. <laughs> we like to, we don't, we don't really wanna do that. Unless you're trying to lose some weight, I'll do some intermittent fasting and all that sort of stuff. But like, there's, you know, th that, that's not really for spiritual reasons. 
with those current trends. But, but simply put, if you were talking about the practice of fasting, the practice of fasting is starving the flesh and feeding the spirit. Simultaneously, starving the flesh and feeding the spirit. And it doesn't have to be from food, although um, the actual the actual practice of fasting is from food. It's not just abstinence from other things, but it is, it is with food. But, but starving the flesh from what it wants, what it says that it needs, and feeding the spirit. The Baptist pastor, John Piper, calls it fast, he calls fasting whole body hungering for God. The whole body hungering for God. Fasting connects our body in a way that we don't usually experience. It's, it's, it's skipping the, the coffee drive through to spend some time in prayer and focusing on the Lord. It's skipping a meal to remember God's provision, letting your body remind you, and it will remind you. It will remind you. You should, you should stop and get something to eat. You're, you're a little on edge. You know, you should have a Snickers. You know, like, you know those commercials? You turn into Betty White. Every time you feel hunger pains, that, 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 is, that reminds you that God is providing spiritual food and living water that never runs dry. Jesus' flesh was hungry, but his spirit was full. Every time the stomach would growl, he would, it would remind him of the provision of God. It was a lesson that Israel learned because God would only provide enough manna for them for one day so that they gathered enough manna. It was like, don't gather more. You don't have refrigerators. You don't have, this is going to spoil. You're not going to be able to gather enough so that you provide on, so that you know that God will provide for you again tomorrow. That's the lesson. But Jesus reminds us here, just because you have food in your stomach doesn't mean that you're full. So Satan joins in the scripture quoting. The second time he tempts Jesus, he's actually gonna quote scripture as well. Look at what he says in Matthew chapter four, verses five through seven. He says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, there it is again, throw yourself down for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is also written, so you got scripture, I got scripture, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. See, Satan's coming after our priorities. In just this one psalm, Satan almost quotes as much scripture as Jesus does in this whole chapter. This is, this is something worth remembering. It's an important truth to know is that when you're battling Satan, he probably knows more scripture than you. Now, of course, he's going to twist the meaning and he's going to use it out of context and he's going to leave out some parts as he does in this psalm. You know, he quotes the psalms here, but he leaves out a part where it actually says, it actually says, and they will support you with their hands in all your ways. Now, why would he leave in all your ways out? Because he knows that all of the ways would not include Jesus putting the father to the test. So he twists the scripture, he leaves parts out. He, he wants Jesus to know and shift his priorities to, to jumpstart God's plan. He's like, yeah, I know what the Bible says, like, but here, we could get this a little bit faster. We could kick this thing off a little quicker. Satan, has Satan ever done this to you, like convinced you that even, even through scripture, as you're reading scripture, that, that you are the main character of the story? Like you kind of forget all the other characters and you're like, oh, this is what I need. I was scrolling through Reddit the other day. I came across this page that's actually called, I am the main character. And it's all these pictures throughout the internet of all kinds of, of people who are in, like this one here was a lady in the, in the subway and she's walking down the middle aisle there um, like, like it's a catwalk, okay? I wouldn't recommend that, but it's her story, her world. We're just living in it, right? And that's what all of these, here's how they describe the page. People who act like they're the center of the world and worthy of all of the attention. And you can just scroll for hours. I wouldn't recommend it, but I would scroll for hours and just go, man, these people are just, they're sitting down in the middle of restaurants. They're making TikTok bowls at, at, you know, Chick-fil-A. Like these people are out of control. But but this, this is what, this is what Satan will do to us as well. I mean, he can do it. Um, he knows scripture so well and he twists it that he deceives us into believing that we're the main character of the story. That every single scripture that you read, you'll read in the most vile way towards your enemies and the most gracious way towards yourself. Well, I know somebody who needs to hear that. I know so, oh man, I should share, you know, I should share that sermon with them. They really need that. It's like, oh, I really need it. That really comforts my heart. You know, you realize we get a lot more of the comfort than we do the conviction from God when we're reading as ourselves as the main character of the story. 
Well, what's interesting here with Satan using Jesus, <laughs> using this tactic with Jesus is, spoiler alert, he is the main character of the story, right? He is the one that this is all about. But Satan is offering Jesus something quicker. He's offering him an easy way out. If he goes to the top of the temple, he throws himself down. And he's rescued by the angels. Everyone's going to see. Everyone's going to know that this is the Messiah. There was actually a Jewish tradition that said that the Messiah would be portrayed and seen in this way, glorious atop the temple. There'd be some miraculous sign that you would see. This would fit that bill, and all the Jews, everyone in Jerusalem would go, it is the Messiah. Party over. But God's plan was not that. That was not God's plan. That was a shortcut to glory. We don't, we don't have Matthew ending in the third chapter. John Mark Comer would describe it in this way. Jesus was at risk of getting the right thing the wrong way. Getting the right thing the wrong way. This was a shortcut to glory. Satan hits us so hard here. If, you're, if your priorities, if you have priorities above following Jesus... If you have priority, priorities that are going to supersede following Jesus, and maybe you don't think they're superseding, but, but in a moment, in a pinch, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, bored, when you're in those areas, you're like, ah, oh, that's going to actually take precedent. I'm actually this before I'm a Christian. He's going to amplify those things. He's going to give you every opportunity to rearrange your priorities for easy ways to get what you think you need and what you think you want. This is something I'm checking myself daily on. I feel like I just got my algorithm like cleared from all of the political stuff that happened over the last four years. And I finally shut off all the right things or whatever. And guess what year it is? <laughs> Here we are. It's all ramping up again. Here four years later, and I'm, I, I'm not really sure, church, that I've learned anything. <laughs> I feel like I'm just primed to go right back to where I was four years ago. And Start saying the things that I shouldn't say and posting things that I shouldn't be posting and being, being harsh and mean and just for a win. And, and I do feel like the number of us that have wrapped ourselves up in our, our politics is concerning. And I'm not here to give a political rant or anything. You don't want that from me. I don't, I don't want that from you, honestly. But this is not political. But, but I do want you to know, church, that this is a call to prayer. A call to prayer. Because Satan is licking his chops for November. He is loving this. He is loving when people in the exact same room can shout down each other or stop talking to each other because they're on opposite sides of the aisle. Knowing that we are about to post and say and spew so much hate and lies and contempt to someone across the aisle, and then we're going to all hoard in here on Sunday mornings and sing, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Would we be a people that prays before we post? Would we be a people that cast our cares upon him before we cast anything at the ballot box? We need to be known as a people of truth and grace, as a people of peace, living out Proverbs 15 that says a calm word turns away wrath. Or 2 Timothy chapter 2 when Paul says to Timothy, a call for gentle instruction when you're arguing or you disagree with somebody. Something you'll notice about Jesus in this passage is that he never loses control. He never spins off. And he's like, I mean, this dude is hungry, like really hungry. He never loses it. He never lashes out. He never takes a Buzz Aldrin swing at the devil, right? He just doesn't do it. He's calm. He's quietly confident. And some of you may read this story and be like, you're Jesus. Why don't you just deck the guy? Like, get rid of him. This is the demeanor of someone whose heart is set on truth who's someone whose spirit is so full of the truth that, that all of the earthly desires have faded away. Jesus refused to get the right thing the wrong way. But there's one more temptation for Jesus. If you look at, at verse eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, notice he doesn't do the question here, if you're the son of God. No, he says, I will give you all of these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Another quote from Deuteronomy. All three times Jesus answers, he answers from Deuteronomy. Read your Old Testament. It's important. Satan goes after the ego. This is the part of us that wants to say, I'm going to take this now because I deserve it. 
This is the temptation for Eve. When she saw the fruit and that it was pleasing to the eye, even though there was lots of other fruit, all the fruit in the world was hers. Every other tree was this one that she couldn't have. There are no kingdoms that Satan can give Jesus that he's not already going to get. He's already going to get it all. We're just, we're three, although very painful years, we're just three years away from from Jesus standing in front of his disciples and saying, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. He's going to rule it all. But Satan is is playing an ego game. He He says, with no cross, no pain, no persecution, just a simple bow down and we'll skip to the end of the book. Straight to where you're ruling everything. I'll give it all to you. And the Greek word here doesn't even suggest that Satan is, is uh, asking Jesus to worship him forever. He's not, if you become a Satanist, I'll give you everything you want. He's not even asking that. He's asking for one simple bow down. More like what you would do when a king walked into a room. You would just bow. That's all he's asking for, the minimal. Just bow down just this once and I'll give you everything that you can see. He just wants him to pay homage to him and the prince of this world would hand over the kingdoms of the world. Of course, Jesus would reject This just shows us how to dismantle the the devil's schemes. Every time, the truth of God shuts him up. Every time, the truth of God shuts him up. He says, worship the Lord your God and worship him only. He says to him, go away, Satan. This fence is not penetrable. Don't, just go. Notice the same words that he says there when he says, go, Satan. That's the same phrase in the Greek that he's gonna say to Peter right before he goes to the cross. Peter offers him the same thing. Hey, we can do this without the cross. Let's just go. Let's get out of here. You don't have to do this. Get behind me, Satan. It's the same phrase that he says to one of his disciples. He's not going to take the easy way out. He's not going to get the right things the wrong ways. But Satan has a way of convincing us that he can offer us something that's ultimately not his to give. He'll toy with your ego. But man, the way he offers us wealth and prominence, the way he makes it look so shiny and pleasing to the eye, it always sounds like a pretty good deal until he gets to the payoff, if you'll just this one time. When you finally see what altar you're actually bowing at. You know, you're you're the top salesperson here at work. You could take a job that would double your salary. All you got to do is just bow down to this altar of overworked and hurry, and you just can't see your family for a couple years, but it's just, just this one time. He'll say, "You you deserve more pleasure in your life. I know you love your wife and your family, but, but your needs are not getting met. It's clear. So if you'll just bow down to that altar of idolatry, just uh, adultery, one, one time, just this one time, it's just, or he'll say, I, I know you have to pass this class to graduate. You've worked so hard to get this far, but you run into some problems. You spend a little too little time on your, you know, homework and stuff, and you've worked so hard, but, but just bow down here to the altar of some cheating and dishonesty. It's just this one time. You'll get what you're, what you, what you're due. It's just a one-night stand. It won't happen again. It's just a little money from the drawer. My boss is already rich enough. It doesn't really matter. It's just an article, and I know it's probably not fully true. But man, it proves my point so well. I'll just... I'll just It's just a quick internet search when I'm bored, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. It's just a few more pills than what I was prescribed. It's just one bow at this one altar one time. It's just one lie. Our biggest problem isn't that we tell lies. It's that we live them. We bow at the altar just once. Satan deceives. The lies become our identity. They twist our desires. They rearrange our priorities. They stroke our ego one more time. I do deserve this. The heart that is set on truth, the heart that is not set on truth will live on lies. I want to finish with a story um, from Greg Pruitt. Greg Pruitt is the president of Pioneer Bible Translators. Before he came to that position, he was a missionary in West Africa. And his work, His work amongst the Yalkuna people there in West Africa actually translated the whole Bible into their language, the first time they could read it into their language. He tells a story in his book um, called Extraordinary Hearing. Corey shared this book with me. It's actually his that I tried to lose. So I just want to read this story with you in closing. Surrounded by people who follow the Quran, he decides that it would be best to start preaching through Genesis. But everyone had heard the stories of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. 
So he wanted to correct those lies. One Saturday, I prepared my sermon. I felt dismayed to find out that I had come to the story about Noah getting drunk and laying naked in his tent. So it's Sunday school teacher's worst nightmare. He did what? Um, I had resolved to skip it until I saw the whole next chapter contain genealogies. I had already determined to skip that too. I mean, who preaches genealogies? So down in the pit of my stomach, I felt something that could have been my conscience. I walked out the door and I started talking to my neighbors about the story of naked Noah. Try that today. That'll be a good time. What are your thoughts on naked Noah? Uh, They recognized it immediately. Yes, of course. That's when Noah cursed his son and he turned black. That's, That's where African people come from, they all said. I don't know if I managed to keep the look of horror from my face. I knew right away that this was the satanic lie that God had destined these chapters to correct. The next morning, I felt very unsure what would happen during the sermon. So I got, uh, I got up and I read the story of Noah and his sons in Genesis 9. But the story took an unexpected turn from the church when I read the words in Yalunka. That's their people's name. He said, Umbata Kana Danga. I'm sure that's exactly how it's said. Which in English reads, Cursed be Canaan, Genesis 9, chapter 25. Instead of cursing Ham, the son who disgraced him, The text says that Noah cursed Canaan, one of Ham's sons, Noah's grandson. Canaan's descendants later conquered by Israel, um, were later conquered by Israel and had nothing to do with Africa. That's where the curse ends. We looked ahead to the genealogy of Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, to find that Cush, the ancestor of the African peoples, had no involvement in the curse at all. Cush was Canaan's oldest brother. The never cursed Cush went on to have descendants who became African emperors, some of them occasionally rule in Egypt from the upper reaches of the Nile River. These were the ancestors of their people. No sooner had I explained all of this than a man in the back of the church leapt to his feet. Wait a minute. If what you're saying is true, that means that Canaan was cursed, not Cush. Wouldn't that mean that we aren't under a curse of Noah? My eyes widened at the interpretation and I stammered, well, well Yes. As I sucked in breath to deliver the next point of my sermon, another man bolted to his feet and shouted, hey, that means that all of us here, we aren't cursed, right? I think you're listening. I started to question the clarity of my message when the third guy jumped to his feet. So you mean to say that we aren't cursed by God? My face must have seemed like a mask of puzzlement at this point, and I nodded wordlessly. Then right down in the front row, a quieter voice, trembling with age, interrupted. The long-retired, venerated pastor, Daniel, didn't stand up to object because it would have taken far too long. Wait a minute, he mused. If I understand you, you mean to say that God didn't curse us. I turned to him at his special seat of honor in the front of the church and I repeated the fourth confirmation. Yes, that is what the Bible says. With a haunted look, he turned back to pose the question. Then how Do you explain it? Up until that moment, it all made sense to them. Every time a child had died of malnutrition or malaria, every hunger pain, it all boiled down to the burden of God's curse on Africa. With just one story and one genealogy from Genesis, Pastor Daniel began to reconsider his entire worldview. If they weren't cursed by God, if, if that could be true, then maybe, maybe it didn't have to be that way. Maybe, just maybe, Africa could rise. Maybe they really could drill wells and plant orchards and change everything. Maybe little African children needn't always suffer hunger. Maybe Africans could work their way out of poverty under a shower of divine blessing instead of a curse. He ends his story by saying, the word of God has power. Even in its strange stories and about naked cursing men, even in genealogies, When the Yaluka people studied the Bible for themselves, they came to know who they really are and who God really is. We hold truth because through it, we we come to know our identity, who we really are, what God has said about us and what he has done for us. But most importantly, we also learn who God really is, that, that he is for us, that he hasn't cursed us. This week, we're going to memorize Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. That we don't live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the Father. 
And you'll actually find a helpful tool on our website that, that, that's a resource, that's a, a lie, truth, declaration. It's gonna help you identify some of the lies in your life. And then you're gonna, you're gonna set that next to the truth of the gospel and the truth of God. And then together we're gonna make declarations that say, we're not living by that anymore. It's a non-starter when, devil comes, when the devil comes and tells me something about my identity, my desires. When he comes and tells me, it strokes my ego and says, you can have this now, or your priorities need to be changed. It's just a non-starter. We can say, get behind me, Satan. As we sit and experience, we're gonna experience a new song that the, that the worship team has brought this morning. And, and I want you to just sit and reflect. You don't have to sing along. You don't have to keep your eyes open, anything like that. I want you just to pray and reflect on what truth God is calling you to. And when Kira directs you to stand during the song, I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to stand. And that's when our prayer team is gonna come down the side. That's when I'll be out here at Decision Point if you wanna talk about what the truth of God can really do to change your life from death to life. I would love to speak and to meet with you. So church, let's experience this together as we listen for the truth of God.